Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Dear Theophilus, in my first book I wrote to you, I wrote all about the things that Jesus did and taught from the time when he began his work until the day he was taken up to heaven. Before he was taken up, he gave instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit to the men he had chosen as his apostles. For forty days after his death, he appeared to them many times in ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and talked with him about the kingdom of God. And when they came together, they gave them this order. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I have told you about, the gift my father pr promised you. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at, at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, The times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority, and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witness for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up to heaven, and as they watched him, a cloud, of, a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had the eyes fixed on the sky, and as he went away, when two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus, who was taken from you into the heavens, will come back to you in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a kilometer away from the city. They entered the city and went up to the room where they were staying. Peter, Jane, Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bob Polymew and Matthew, James, son of Alpheus, Simon the Patriot and Judas, Judas, son of James. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Amen. A long, long time ago, way back in the dim and distant past in the 1960s, when I was young, or at least younger, there was a film which became a box office success. I don't know if it won any BAFTA awards. I don't know if there were BAFTA awards in these days. But uh, the film made a mint because I believe it had a message. And uh, the message was contained in the last few seconds of the film. The film was called Alfie. If you were of the vintage of the 1960s, then perhaps you saw it. And if you did, then you'll remember the ending with the shot of Westminster Bridge in London and Alfie and his girlfriend strolling over in the sunset. And the girl turning and facing Alfie and then the words of the theme song sounding out. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> the words. What's it all about, Alfie? What's it all about? I mean, this world, life, existence, that which all of us as human individuals are involved in. What's it all about? That's a question, of course, which many people are asking in their hearts in the 1990s if not on their lips. Perhaps some of you this morning are asking that question. I'd be very surprised if you've never asked that question in your life because it's a very important question. What is life all about? And let me say right away that I believe that the only place where you find an answer to that question is this place. That's quite a claim to make, isn't it? This place and places like this where the Bible is opened and taught. 
And in particular, the passage that we read this morning from Acts chapter 1, containing verses which I believe provides a key to unlock the mystery of life. And life is a mystery in many respects, many mysteries in life. I think I've told some of you before of a funeral which made quite an impression upon me a number of years ago. It was a funeral in Edinburgh, and the impression it made upon me was because of something that the minister said in his address. It was the funeral of a young lady who died from cancer, leaving behind a husband and two small children. And she was a convinced believer and showed great courage and faith in it all. But yet, despite that, humanly speaking, it's inexplicable, isn't it? And the minister said this in his address. He said, there are many mysteries in life that Christians face. There are many things that Christians don't know. But the things that Christians do know far outweigh the things that Christians don't know. That, it seems to me, is a very simple but a very profound statement. And in Acts chapter 1, we learn three things that Christians most certainly know. And these three things are more important than the things that we don't know. First of all, we are taught where the world's heading. Secondly, why we are here. And thirdly, how we should live. And we're going to look at these quickly in turn. The Bible tells us where the world's heading. And wouldn't many people like to know its destination? It seems to me that We can say that most people around us today share a concern, do they not, for the state of the world. What kind of world are we building for our children and our grandchildren? This seems to be a common concern. What kind of world are we going to find in the the 21st century? If indeed there is a world in the 21st century, and that's open to doubt in many people's minds. Where is the world heading? Now, of course, we can't possibly begin to understand the answer to that question. We can't work it out for ourselves here below. We need a messenger from heaven to tell us where the world's heading. And that's precisely what was provided for the disciples of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. For it was the angel who said, to the disciples as they were gazing up into the sky, ye men of Galilee, why are you looking up into the sky? You see, there were stargazers in in those days just as there are in our days, standing, wondering, thinking, looking, hoping, utterly bewildered and baffled. Ye men of Galilee, why are you standing, looking up into the sky? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go. Where is the world heading? Well, it's quite clear according to the Bible. It's heading to the great climax of all history when Jesus Christ will return in power and glory at the end of the age. That's the goal of history, Jesus' return. Jesus is, in fact, the key to history. That's what the Bible teaches us. The Bible tells us that history is his story, God's story, and God's story is centered in what Jesus Christ did, these great events of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, we have set before us God's timetable, and he spells out, for us, Luke in chapter 1, God's program in history involving the great five events of Jesus Christ. The dying and rising of Jesus, mentioned in verse 3 of our reading, the return 
of Jesus to heaven mentioned in verse 9, the coming of the Holy Spirit of Jesus mentioned in verse 8, the church going out to witness to Jesus mentioned also in verse 8, and then the return of Jesus to earth mentioned in verse 11. Five great events. And it's terribly important to remember these five events and to remember the order of them. If we get them out of sequence, then we become very confused. The five great events, the cross resurrection, the ascension, Pentecost, the mission of the church, and the second coming of Christ. So where are we? Which point are we at today? Where are we located? Well, we are located, of course, at event number four. And event four comes after event three and before event five. We are here in this space waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And that means two things. That means, first of all, that the only event left in God's timetable is the return to earth of his Son in power and glory. And the second thing that we learn is that this period that we are in, this space that we are in today, is of unknown length. We don't know when Jesus Christ is going to return. We don't know when the end of the age will be. We'd like to know, of course, just as the first friends of Jesus wanted to know. They said to him, verse 6, Lord, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, verse 7, it's not for you to know the times and the occasions. Just get on with your job, which is mission. John Wesley, the great evangelist a few hundred years ago, was once asked the question what he would do if he was told and knew that Jesus was going to return the day after tomorrow. And Wesley took out his diary and he opened it and he said, well, tomorrow I'm going to be in Sunderland and the day after tomorrow I'm going to be in Newcastle in the morning and Tynemouth in the afternoon. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my job. And that's really what it's all about. We are located around four. Where's the world heading tomorrow towards the return of Jesus Christ? What's God's agenda today? It's the mission of the church throughout the entire world. It's terribly important to know where we are And that leads on to the second great truth we learn in this passage. The Bible tells us, secondly, why we are here. Why are we here? Well, the answer to that question must be quite obvious by now in the light of what's just been said. If mission is God's priority and agenda, then witness is our task. You shall be my witnesses, said Jesus, verse 8. But wasn't he speaking to the first apostles, you say? Well, yes, that's true. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. There they are. He was speaking to the apostles. But notice what Jesus goes on to say. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But the apostles didn't have time to go to the ends of the earth. The apostles never entered the metropolis of Moody's Burn. The apostles went many, many places, but they never went to the electric scheme or Gart Ferry or the Salveson. So when Jesus is talking about the ends of the earth, he must be talking beyond the days of the apostles, even down to our days. You shall be my witnesses. Oh, what's a witness? My dictionary tells me that a witness is someone who has personal knowledge and gives personal evidence. I've only been to Glasgow Sheriff Court once as an observer, I hasten to add. And my observation was that those going into the witness box have to have one requirement at least. And this would apply to anybody going into any witness box in the land, not just Glasgow Sheriff Court. And the requirement is this. They have to have personal knowledge and give personal evidence and to do it truly. 
you shall be my witnesses. That is to say, witnesses to me, says Jesus. And you've got to have direct contact with Jesus and recognition of Jesus before you can witness to him. You cannot be a witness to Jesus if you've not had contact with him. You can't be a witness to Jesus if you've not recognized him for who he is. I wonder if you've heard the story of the lady up in Aberdeenshire who one day received a knock on her door. The rain was lashing outside. It was a, a really foul day. The clouds were dark and there was a bit of a wind as well. And she opened the door and there was an old woman standing at the door with her hair absolutely bedraggled. And she, she asked for the loan of an umbrella. And the lady inside had two umbrellas. One was brand new. She'd just bought it from Inverness. It had never been used. And the second umbrella was an old battered one which hardly worked. And she said to herself, which umbrella will I give this old lady? And she said, well, that old dear won't know any better, she said to herself. And I'll probably never see her again, so I'll give her the battered umbrella. And so she did, closed the door. A few days later, up to the door came a large car and a parcel and a letter delivered. The parcel containing the battered umbrella. The letter, a word of sincere thanks for the loan of the umbrella. And the address, Balmoral Castle. <laughs> well, she hadn't recognized the Queen Mother for who she was. And if we don't recognize Jesus Christ for who he is, then we are never likely to do any good for him in this world. If we don't have contact, if we don't think much of him, we're never likely to spread much influence for him where we live, where we work. You shall be my witnesses. Well, that's the job of those who are Christians, of course, who have turned and trusted and taken Jesus as their Savior and know him. That's their job, to be witnesses. And incidentally, that's the reason why we have this service. That's the reason why this morning service was started in Moody'sburg so that it would be an act of witness to the surrounding area and that others would be brought in to know Jesus Christ. That's why we engage in visitation in our parish every September. That's the reason why we went out last September and covered 500 homes or thereabouts in Moody'sburn. That's the reason why one evening two people who are here this evening went down to Bridgeburn Drive and parked their car and got out of their car and crossed the road and went down the pavement with a piece of paper in their hands, the numbers to visit, and checked the next number. And they saw what it was and they went in a door and they went up to the first floor, the second floor, checking the numbers as they were going in Bridgeburn Drive, 225, 227, and they arrived at 229 and knocked the door. There somebody was waiting. You've guessed it was. <laughs> somebody, I might say, who had been waiting and yearning and longing for such a visit. And Alistair and Jean shared the good news of Jesus with Linda. And as witnesses, they helped her to find personal faith in Christ. And that's why we've got a baptism this morning. We are coming to mark our gratitude to Jesus Christ and to mark the recognition that this family have been set apart now as witnesses for Jesus. That's their job. And that's our job if we are Christians. That's why we are here. And ultimately, that's all that matters. We know where the world's heading. We know why we're here. And thirdly, we know how we should live. And this is very important, isn't it? Because how can we? How can we be witnesses in this complex and frightening world in which we live? After all, we are just ordinary people beset with all kinds of problems. 
But look at the list of people named in verse 13 in this chapter. Why does Luke set before us this list? Well, one of the reasons it seems to me is to remind us that these first witnesses of Jesus were ordinary people with great problems. Among the people who are listed here were people with, well, tremendous problems. They'd made terrible mistakes. There were skeletons in the cupboard of, of many of these people. There were people listed here who had terrible doubts and were terrible worriers. There were people listed here who had terrible tempers and weaknesses and frailties. How on earth could these people turn the world upside down as the Bible said they did? What did these people need if they were to be witnesses? What do we need? And the answer in a word is power. And that's precisely what Jesus promised. You shall have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's what he said. Well, what is this spiritual power that came down at Pentecost and has remained with the church and is available for every Christian believer? What is this power? The Greek word is dunamis, from which we get our word dynamo. You see, when somebody becomes a Christian, God places within that person his dynamo, the Holy Spirit, providing a perpetual supply of divine energy a continual supply of divine strength to help us to be all that we should be, especially in witnessing. But what does the Holy Spirit do with this power? What is this power that helps us to be witnesses? How does it work out? Well, it seems to me that it's, it's this. The Holy Spirit helps us to be very, very sure of Jesus in all the situations of life that we find ourselves in. Notice I said not to be very, very sure of ourselves. Many people would like to be sure of them, themselves, and the world offers this again and again. I, I saw this advert in a newspaper just the other day, heading, doesn't everyone have the right to feel good about themselves? And then underneath these words, if you were born with a nose you've always been unhappy with, no matter what anyone tells you, you'll probably always be unhappy with it. So why put up with it any longer when thanks to the latest cosmetic surgery techniques, it can so easily be corrected? Now in reshaping your nose, this allows for the treatment to be carried out internally, thereby avoiding the chance of external scanning, leaving with you the nose that you want, that entirely suits your face. And the truth is, it will not only change the way you look, it will change your whole life. That's what the world offers. To make us feel really good about ourselves. Now the Holy Spirit doesn't do that when he comes within us and fills us. But he does make us feel very sure about Jesus Christ in all the situations of life that we find ourselves in. And you say, well, how does this help with witnessing? Well, it's a question of overspill, isn't it? If somebody's carrying a jug of orange juice from the kitchen into this room shortly and somebody else runs across that person's path and bumps into that person, what happens? Well, there's overspill. The juice overflows. Now, if we are full of Jesus Christ and his ways and somebody comes across our path during the week or bumps into us, as we say, what's the net result? Well, there should be overspill something of the life of Jesus Christ his way as we engage in conversation and talk to this person that's how it works but this power that uh, God gives to us when we become believers in Jesus Christ this power of the Holy Spirit to witness by life and by lip is not something that's automatic or mechanical it's something you've got to ask for and wait for and pray for as the disciples did in verse 14 they devoted themselves to prayer and God intends that we depend upon him for his power in every situation and wait for it and ask for it and pray for it and in the end of the day what we are praying for is not 
asking for more of the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit might have more of us as we commit ourselves to him. And so this sermon ends with a call to commitment. And the gospel always issues a call for commitment. Baptism is about commitment. And this message is about commitment. So I call you now to commit all that you know of yourself to all that you know of Jesus Christ. Will you do that now as we turn to him in a moment of prayer? Let's pray.